welcome everyone, in particular the participants, but of course also all the uh, attendees um, to this round table uh, on running out of time, the role of temporality in climate change activism. Uh, this round table, I think, is part of a series of multiple round tables on climate change and politics that has been running throughout this week of conference, and we have the honor to uh, close that, uh, that series of round tables. And I would like to thank everyone who's still here bearing with us today at the very end of this conference. I hope you have some energy and space in your mind left over to take in one final uh, discussion, which I think will be very uh, interesting. Um, my name is Joost de Moor. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Leide University at the Global Transformations and Governance Challenges Project. Um, and with me here today um, are Professor Max Boyko from the University of Colorado Boulder, Dr. Jens Markar uh, from the Technical University of Darmstadt, Dr. Annelien Keynes from the University of Ghent and KU Leuven, and Professor Nicole Durr from the University of Copenhagen. Um, I will ask the, each of them to introduce themselves briefly um, at the end of, of a further introduction, because I would like to introduce everyone here to the kind of broader idea and the thinking behind uh, this roundtable and how it came together. And this is maybe also the point to mention that uh, Jens has been very helpful in helping to set up this panel. He was initially a co-chair, but when one of our speakers dropped out, Jens kindly uh, took over uh, the role of the fourth um, panelist. So thank you, Jens, for your flexibility there and your help with setting this up. Moving on then to a bit more the content um, of this uh, round table, and I'll come back a bit to the housekeeping of this round table um, in a second. And the first question is perhaps, why should we care about time and, and by extension about temporality? Isn't time something really banal, something that's everywhere around us, something that's moving forward, regardless of whether we would try to do something about it or not? I think that that sort of implicit notion of time, of, of natural time, of ever moving forward, is, is, is perhaps the, the basic notion of time we have and the reason why we often don't talk about it and don't problematize it. And when we talk about time, we typically assume that time is a neutral thing, is almost a kind of natural law going forward in a, in a standardized way. But I think especially in the context of climate change and uncertain futures, social scientists are increasingly coming around to the idea that time is actually not so straightforward as we think it might be. And we're com coming increasingly around to the idea that time is actually a social product, uh, something that we can also therefore contest, and therefore it is also relevant to climate activism. And that's very broadly the topic of this round table today. So time is, of course, inherent to climate change. Um, climate change has a lot to do with urgency, with running out of time, with acting now to ensuring that we have safe futures. Time is always there implicitly or explicitly in climate activism. But we also know that it's not neutral, or at least that time is not necessarily agreed upon. And one of the main reasons why there is disagreement is around the question of whether it's actually already too late to do something about climate change or not. And one of the things that uh, fascinates me is that it's very difficult to take a position on that debate because there is scientific evidence for either side of that position. And I think that many climate activists are facing that difficulty as well. At the same time, climate activism has for a very long time, I think at least going back to Copenhagen, that this picture uh, is from sort of Copenhagen 2009 climate summit, but probably already before, been caught in this never ending moment of now or never. It's always now or never to do something about climate change, and it has been for a very long time. And again, that sort of indicates some of the peculiarities of time and climate activism, I think. And so when I was asked recently to write a uh, contribution to the Oxford Handbook of Comparative Environmental Politics on climate activism, it's time and the role of time that I've started thinking about and to just give you a few ideas of where I think time is, is quite essential to climate activism. Um, there's discussions about how climate activists should no longer wait for governments to act and to take matters into their own hands through DIY activism. While at the same time, others say that these kinds of small scale actions don't, aren't well sufficiently large enough and that we should push for large scale action now. Others claim that it's time for system change now, the end of capitalism, 
whereas others say we don't have time for that. We need to do that what's right in front of us, the things we can achieve here and now. And finally, there's discussions around whether we should continue to focus on mitigating climate change or whether it's already time to leave that goal behind and start focusing on adaptation. So those are some of the discussions that are going on within climate activism that I think underline the importance of time and temporality and the need for us to think more through that, how we can understand temporality and climate activism, especially also understanding it as a social construct. For instance, who decides whether it's too late and for what is it actually too late? Why is it too late and what comes after we've decided whether or not it's too late? And more fundamentally, I think this presents us with an opportunity to rethink time in a more general sociological way. This moment seems to be pushing us beyond modern notions of time, time as going, always going forward along with human progress. And what we see instead, I think, is more contradictory processes of contested futures and uh, temporalities unfolding. And what I mean by contradictory here is perhaps best captured in this picture that I saw passing by this week coming from uh, an Extinction Rebellion action taking place in London, if I'm not mistaken, where the, actors, uh, where the activists were holding this banner with the text, act now because it's too late. And of course, there is a contradiction. We expect activists to hold a banner that says act now because otherwise it will be too late. But I, Extinction Rebellion activists have incorporated apparently this notion that time and temporality are deeply contradictory in the moment that we find ourselves in. And so this is in a very broad terms the thing that I hope the panelists, um, well, I'm sure the panelists will have something interesting to say about. Um, but before asking them uh, to introduce themselves and to go to their presentations, uh, just a few words on uh, housekeeping and timekeeping within this uh, round table. Um, we've agreed that all the panelists will speak for roughly 10 minutes. Um, after that, we should have plenty of time for uh, contributions, questions from the audience. Uh, the audience will notice that they have been muted. They cannot unmute themselves. That has to do with the fact that this uh, roundtable is being recorded. You can, and I encourage you to um, add your questions um, in the chat, and I will uh, read them out loud and ask the panelists to respond to them. If there's too many questions, then of course I will have to make a selection of trying to do that um, as well as I can. Um, so with that being said, and with stopping my sharing now, I'd like to hand over to the panelists for first a short round of introductions and their work who they are uh, in the order in which they will present. So that's uh, Max, then Jens, then Anna, then Nicole. So thank you very much, all of you for being here and uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll begin. My name is Max Boykoff. I'm a professor in environmental studies here at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I'm also a fellow in a Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences, which is about 900 researchers, largely natural physical scientists that are also a part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, but I represent a smaller group of social science scientists with interdisciplinary training. Um, so I'm pleased to be here and have this conversation. Thank you and welcome, Jens. Yeah, also, also good afternoon from my side or good, good morning, Max. Um, yeah, I'm a classical, what I would say, political scientist at uh, Technical Uni University of Darmstadt, but with, with some well vivid interest in uh, science and technology studies and uh, social movement studies. And this is, um, the kind of tension I'm in. So I'm mainly working on straightforward questions such as how to institutionalize climate action in the global south. Um, but these kind of issues um, when it comes to power struggles and um, well issues of contestation related to climate action are kind of at the heart of my what, what I think is, is important and so merging SDS insights, merging sociology insights on aspects like imagination or time making um, are what I'm interested in, but also I'm kind of humbled uh, to, to be to be here and, and talk about this. So it's more about raising questions than giving answers, at least from my side. Thank you, Annalyn. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Annalyn Kenis. I'm a senior research fellow of the Research Foundation Flanders. I'm affiliated with KU Leuven and Ghent University, both in Belgium, and I've mainly been working on a um, 
processes of politicization and depoliticization in relation to environmental discourses, mostly climate change, but also air pollution and genetic engineering, like both hegemonic discourse, like for instance, the green economy, um, transitions management, and a lot of counter hegemonic ones like uh, climate action transition towns, the school strikes for climate. I will also say a bit more about that later. And actually I'm doing field work at the moment in London um, about extinction rebellion. And maybe also relevant from next year onwards, I will actually be working with Professor Mark Hume at the University of Cambridge, who was also uh, actually also was invited for this panel if I'm right and has been done a lot of relevant work on time and climate change as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nicole. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Dörr. I'm from the University of Copenhagen, and I'm an associate professor there in sociology. And I'm also um, running the Commons Research Center. Commons doesn't stand for the Commons, but it's Copenhagen Research Center on Political Mobilization and Social Movement Studies. And I'm a specialist of democracy and movements and deliberation at the local grassroots level in institutions. So transnational movement deliberation and debate um, and, um, and also local um, uh, tree sitters who have their own assemblies. I'm gonna talk about that Germany, Denmark and other countries. Thank you for having this debate. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, moving to the first presentation, uh, Max, when we, when Jens and I contacted you a few months ago setting up this panel, we asked you to speak about uh, the topic of from climate temporality to time for action. And we wrote, while the reality of climate change is beyond doubt, the timing and extent of specific climate disruptions remains uncertain. How can climate activists communicate and mobilize temporal aspects like climate deadlines or emergencies in a meaningful way? Um, and uh, of course, you have complete freedom to address that question or not, but uh, by means of introduction, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I will do everything I can to, to keep my initial comments into 10 minutes. So please just signal to me and I'll respect that. Um, lots to say on that prompt and that question. Let me just begin by um, saying that we are at a point in time thinking about climate temporality that it's been 800,000 years since carbon dioxide and methane levels have been this high. It is, uh, Carbon dioxide levels are 50% higher since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. That 2020 is the ninth year in a row that global sea levels have hit a new record. And they're rising about an inch a decade. 2020 globally was just behind 2016 for the hottest year in recorded history. And 2020 made up part of what has been seen as the hottest decade on record, 2011 to 2020. So when we talk about the times that we're in, things are not what they used to be. And I'll return to that uh, time permitting in just a moment. So when we think about the challenges associated with climate change, uh, one of the most prominent existential sets of challenges, I put forward just an argument we can return to that it is a mistake to think of this as a single issue. In fact, climate change is uh, intersecting many other challenges throughout the way in which we live, work, play, pray, relax in society. It's a threat multiplier. It weaves through issues like public health, food, foreign policy, poverty, water, immigration, so forth and so on. And while we've made all these advances within the sciences, uh, my concern is that oftentimes communications are stuck. And so this mo mo movement to engagement and action through conversations and activism as well, uh, has been about, there has been a bottleneck, there have been challenges there. So there's often what's considered climate silence. This has been um, studied here in the United States through polling, that there are stunning uh, figures that 65% of US Americans talk about climate change with their family or friends rarely or never. You turn that on its head, there's only about 35% of a representative sample that are talking about climate change with family, friends, coworkers, very, uh, occasionally or often. Focusing in on the, the prompt at hand though, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about climate temporality, activism and action. Um, and by 
invoking and mentioning that notion around conversations. Conversations can often be that pathway to considerations of the perspective of uh, the spectrum of possible actions. So how can we creatively overcome that climate silence, spark productive conversations to uh, open up pathways to action across the political spectrum? It has been something that I've been taking up in my own research quite a lot over time, trying to better understand the places of uh, the movement from formal science and policy undertakings to people's everyday lives and back and forth uh, from the formal to the informal. One of the challenges in these movements from the formal to the informal is the way in which climate change was framed at the outset as a pollution problem. And with that came the uh, ushering in of scientific ways of describing and explaining the, the changing climate all around us. I put forward just a set of um, IPCC and other international bodies who put forward documents and put forward reports, the most recent being this physical science basis that just came out uh, early this past month. And it gives credence to this notion that if we just continue to give people more information, they're gonna do the right thing. And there's a lot more that I can say there as well. Of this notion of trying to just pour more science into these conversations where we know that actually we are complicated people, we live in a complicated society, that collective action has many other inputs um, as well. And so while the deficit model, this idea that we can just chuck more science into these conversations to get people mobilized and, and active is flawed, there is this ongoing uh, process, of which I'm now implicated in a part. I've contributed to the third working group that'll be coming out in March 2022 through the IPCC. Suzanne Moser has had some uh, really important things to say in these areas. Uh, among them, she's talked about how providing information and filling knowledge gaps is necessary, but rarely sufficient to create active behavioral engagement. And the kind of sustained activism that I think is on our uh, plates for conversation today is also a part of this. There must be more. So thinking about where we can find greater engagements, to expand out these pathways, thinking about uh, cultural dimensions around climate change, social movements that have entered in over the last decade or more. We've enlarged our considerations, not just of scientific ways of knowing, but of experiential ways of knowing, of emotional ways of knowing, of visceral, of tactile, of tangible, aesthetic uh, ways of learning and knowing about climate change. And so a lot of this, as you can see from these selected protest signs, demonstration uh, you know, pronouncements, is that this relates back to the science. And this particular sign, if you can see this, relates to the, the often the challenges that we face in temporality of what do we want we want action now. When do we want it? Through this slow and sometimes torturous process of peer review, but it's important. And I'm happy to elaborate on that as well. Uh, so these are ways in which young people across uh, you know, age ranges are engaging. This is one of many um, photos taken of a young people's climate march, Fridays for the Future. And even just uh, in the news in the Guardian today, in the print edition, you can see the doctors, our medical professionals are taking action in a dying outside JP Morgan offices to highlight the dangers of fossil fuel investments. These are ways to expand these considerations, to help us think about what our collective action challenges beyond what can be that IPCC scientific report and help to complement and further amplify in this consideration around temporality and climate activism. So to quote Rush Holt, who is uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science CEO of uh, past years, facts by themselves are voiceless. And so it is that important production of communication, of conversation as pathways to activism and engagement that are important. I'm not gonna dwell on some of these slides too long because I, I do, I'm mindful of our time. I do wanna put up here as a placeholder though, important work by Annabella Carvalho and Jacqueline Burgess that have talked about the passage of time from 
on your screen left to right. And the movements between our public in our public sphere above the axis, the x axis, and below the private sphere. And just to point out that it, over time, any time slice here, many things are going on. There's the production of forms and texts and communication strategies like the dying of doctors that are uh, framing these issues in the public sphere, right? This first moment as they talk about it. And there's a lot of power there. What it, who, who are uh, able to have those voices in the public sphere? Also happening is all the things that are going on around us. We can think about, I saw a US American flag at half staff yesterday. I thought there's countless reasons why that may be the case. And we can think about all the different things that are going on in our lives from Afghanistan to many uh, flood hurricane events here in the United States, wildfires and so on that may affect our public carrying capacity to take on this messaging amid another many other things going on. And then finally in this third moment as they talk about it, as it moves into our private sphere, we, are, we integrate this into our lived cultures and social relations in very different ways, individually, as communities of scholarship, as communities of action. And so it's important to think about these moments that are cycling all the time and then any time slices taking them into account. So one of the things I just wanna point out, highlighting this uh, discussion that we're having around advocacy and activism. I've written a book, I'll say a few more words about it in a moment, uh, where I focused a chapter in on academic climate advocacy and activism. And pointed out, thank you, Joseph, pointed out that there are these modes across the spectrum. And if we just put up basic definitions about advocacy and activism, we can expand out this spectrum. Oftentimes there is this denigration of activism and advocacy from academia as that type two advocacy of advocating for particular policy outcomes, but particularly in today's uh, environment with the, the considerations around the notion of fake news and post-truth, that advocacy for scientific evidence is as critically important now as ever. And so if we as an academic community, as a research community uh, are, are shying away from that, we're squandering opportunities for engagement. I've written about this in addition to this chapter drawn in some survey work and in the interest of time, I'm happy to return to this later. Um, this sit, fits into a book that I've written about trying to understand what works, how, when, why, under what circumstances. I've had the privilege of being able to draw in a tremendous amount of other scholarship that I can elaborate on too in our discussion, if you wish. And it helps, the bottom line here is that there is no silver bullet. There is no one particular action, whether it be doctors staging a day in, whether it be young people uh, demonstrating every first Friday of the month. What we need is a proliferation of many entry points into engagement for our children. And so with that comes a range of guidance that I've been able to put forward. And the one that I highlight here is emphasizing the here and now. When we think about temporality and act activism, this focus on not a distant target, not a distant place, but what is going on right here and now. Uh, so when we think about human environment relationships, I mentioned at the outset things are not what they used to be. I mean, just to further emphasize that, you can see on the left-hand side is atmospheric temperatures, on the right is ocean, uh, upper ocean heat content. Oops. And uh, really the, la the last cooler than average month on the right-hand side of uh, in our atmosphere was December 1984 globally. So that means if you're younger than 36 years and, and, and a half roughly, you haven't lived in a colder than an average month on this planet. So while things are not what they used to be, we need to be very careful about considerations of nostalgia. We need to understand that young people are stepping into uh, these conversations, this place of activism, where this has been on the public agenda for several several decades, thank you. And so that is part of the changing human environment relationship that I just wish to introduce with my initial comments. I'm involved in several activities here uh, at the university that I'm happy to talk about further as well. And the short answer to this, does the scale of the response match the scale of the challenges? In uh, short, no, nowhere near. And we can add in temporality to, to further that out in our discussion. So thank you very much. 
stop sharing. Thank you so much, Max. Um, and thank you um, for, I think, already putting a large number of interesting points on the table. I'm sure we'll be able to come back to some of those, such as the need to act in the here and now, whether that's, I'm, I'm sure some of the other speakers will, will come back to that. Um, moving on to Jens and to introduce Jens, we have the topic uh, problematizing time in climate change research. Arguments about time are inevitably arguments about politics, but how can we contest the neutral apolitical framing of decarbonization timescales and thus flesh out the politics behind time making? Fascinating question, Jens, that you posed to yourself uh, one way or another. Um, and uh, yeah, floor is yours. Yours. Yeah, th yeah. Thanks, Joost. Uh, thanks for, for your kind words. And also thanks, Max, for, for these uh, fascinating first um, insights into uh, also the, the way dealing with different time scales or the way different actors deal with uh, time scales. Um, and what I would like to contribute here is um, uh, not so much directed directly towards um, the social movements um, we're talking about, but whether on a kind of on a meta level, um, talking about how researchers and we as particularly as social science scholars dealing with temporal issues um, and the politics attached to temporal issues. Um, uh, when it comes to climate climate action. And this is, um, as I said before, and as I warned you before, so I'm not an expert on, on temporality or social movement studies either, but it, it's, it's more, more of an interest uh, in these topics and the struggle um, of, I think, as we all experience uh, as social scientists, how to, how to unpack um, the social construction of, of issues such as time making. Um, and how, how we deal with it. So it's rather some, some reflections and it's based on a, a recent perspective piece um, I wrote together with um, uh, um, Lauren Stellina, sorry, um, uh, in Energy Research and Social Science dealing about, um, well, having particularly the same title, I would say, Making Time, Making Politics and How to Problematize Temporality in Climate Change Research. Um, so, when we think about climate deadlines, and uh, now you see here a clip from CNN, it could be any other clip. Um, you don't hear uh, 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 him now speaking, which is not too bad. And I think the, the most important um, aspect to take from here, from him, uh, from Jim, Jim Shooter, is um, that time is running out to address climate change, his quote. Um, and that was in 2018, probably many of you remember when, well, already outdated, it's not the last, but the previous, um, so before that, the IPCC report uh, setting 2030 as a deadline, or at least this is how it was communicated. And this is how many, many other news outlets um, mentioned the Guardian already, uh, Max, um, how they, how they um, framed um, the insights we have from, um, from this IPCC report. And so, it is one of the, the most prominent examples of how temporality and, and deadlines um, trying to push political agendas and trying to push for change. And you see this, these vivid images um, uh, standing um, next to this uh, new IPCC report that was, that was published then. And I think for me, the most important um, or most interesting and fascinating line was then at the, the very last uh, words from Shuto saying, well, it's science and you'd actually, or you think it would not be disputed. Um, and I would like to challenge this argument a bit um, because I would say that arguments about time and temporality and these deadlines um, are inevitably arguments also about politics, about social order, about ideas of the future and not, not um, and also as you also pointed out in the beginning, not a neutral and fixed um, phenomenon. And this is what I just said, I think. Um, so, and, and now let me briefly explain what I mean with that. Um, because it's, it's somewhat kind of a delicate terrain to, to move into, um, and the argument is not at all unproblematic, because it points at a contested field where on the one hand we see climate movements using deadlines, um, well, although it can be too late already, or if we have 12 years time, or if we have 10, 10 more years time, or nine now, um, it doesn't matter. But on the other hand, we see a lot of climate skeptics, um, climate deniers like Mark Moreno, 
using these arguments against climate uh, climate action and making well kind of um, using these arguments against um, uh, the proponents of a climate change or strong climate change agenda. Um, and delegitimizing claims about uh, or that, that are based on deadlines based on certain temporal ideas of when to take action and what for. So obviously I don't want to put myself on this uh, second um, side of the story, but rather encourage a kind of critical um, approach to its, uh, to its deadlines, to its temporal issues, um, to unpack the conflicts, tensions and ambiguities um, related to different time scales. And I would like to do with the next three slides, so hopefully be, be quick here, um, with past reflections, um, as I call it, present debates and future hopes. So if we look back uh, into the past, um, we're not at all looking into a new phenomena. So time has become a key reference point uh, for, for measuring success or failure uh, and progress of climate action. But at the same time, there's little, um, little reflection, at, at least in climate change research, uh, on how time is constructed in these targets, uh, by whom it is constructed, what kind of um, actors, institutions are behind it, and, and what for what for what purpose? Sorry, um, this is interesting because um, we have quite a long debate in sociology uh, and, and related fields about the conceptualization of time, and I think Barbara Adam is uh, one of the most prominent figures here, and I can can highly recommend everyone to to read her book uh, on on social time. Um, and yeah, using the term social time um, makes already the point that time is always a social construct, depending on, on cultural, on individual, um, on, on social, political and power related aspects. Um, and, and saying that the, the conceptualization of time and the way we ut utilize time um, also in, in social theories, so talking to us as scholars, um, is, is um, highly important and, and should be um, yeah, should, should be considered as as something to to, um, to to do research on and not take it as a given, take it as a neutral form of um, of everyday life. Um, and I think the, the other thing why 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 I like this this book is also um, that she reflects about her struggle to to push through this with this kind of argument, um, because there is always the question: Well, so what? There are these these deadlines. There are these scientific um, models telling us. Um, how much time we have if we want to avoid certain um, levels of dangerous anthropogenic climate change. Um, so why should we put our, our, our brains into, into this um, where the science tells us what, what to do and what needs to be done and what happens if, if it doesn't happen, uh, if, if we don't do anything. Um, so what is, what is the matter and what is the purpose here? Um, so, and, and I think a good answer lies in, in when we look into our own research field or in, in our own research community, and this is broadly considered, well, climate energy uh, researchers. Um, so a snapshot here, um, which probably many of you are aware of, is um, well, kind of a never-ending debate about how, how, how quick um, and speedy transformations can actually be. And there's this one camp saying, well, it takes time. Um, shifting technologies and uh, getting rid of fossil fuels is just uh, naturally uh, a cumbersome and long process that takes decades or generations. So, uh, Arnold Gubler, uh, Matsuf Smil, and others um, propagate these ideas of um, well, slow decarbonization processes. Whereas others, uh, more from a normative direction, um, take into account other factors such as uh, political, social, and institutional factors, arguing it's not necessarily uh, a slow process, but it can be quicker um, depending on, on what kind of perspective you have on time and what gets attached to time. So is it only about um, uh, natural differences? Is it about technological changes? Or is it also about broader social and political changes? Um, and what might help to to bring some order into these uh, different different notions of time is to think about various dimensions of times. And these are not, not exclusive and these are not um, all encompassing, 
But just as an idea of how to structure our thinking here is that time is often being linked to natural phenomena. So if you think about planetary boundaries, if you think about tipping points, if you think about um, natural processes that shape our idea of how much time we have to act uh, to achieve a certain outcome, um, this is often like physical, geophysical basis um, behind time making. So I think that's two minutes. Thanks, Jules. Um, then we have time and knowledge. So what kind of evidence-based urgency is being postulated? What, what is science saying? And how is action triggered by different forms of knowledge? And this is not necessarily only IPCC report. This can be situated uh, knowledge. This can be local knowledge. This can be uh, indigenous knowledge, um, whatever you want. Um, then there is a whole lot of research doing um, or that, that works on technological changes, technological choices. Um, um, that are linked to, to certain past dependencies, uh, lock-ins, et cetera. And I think for, for me, the crucial part here and, and where there's most uh, room for, um, for change is uh, questions about, it's also the most well, messy, messiest area of all, uh, time and society. So what, what are the social and political uh, implications of certain temporal ideas, uh, deadlines, et cetera? And um, here is where I think political science scholars can benefit a lot of from quite old um, SDS research, uh, social movement studies that take up this challenge and uh, think about what um, what gets well, what gets unmuted, what gets silenced by certain ideas of temporality, uh, certain ideas of decarbonization pathways. Um, um, one example is that when we look into how um, decarbonization timeframes become globalized, this is also a meaning, um, or what, what is, let's put into the question, what, what does it mean for different actors um, uh, that are responsible for, uh, for global greenhouse gas emissions? And, and how are inequalities, uh, how are um, disparities, et cetera, in society being reflected here? And final, final slide here, um, I'm running out of time already. Um, is to, to end with what Benjamin uh, Sovako and Gilles have said that we need to reframe or repoliticize what past transitions accomplished or what post transitions prevent, prevent from occurring. Um, I agree to that, but this needs to have to unpack um, what time is actually um, about and how temporal orders um, are linked to political order, are linked to different ideas of what a social, uh, social life and, and uh, what a livable future should look like. So as I, as I warned you in the beginning already, so it leaves me at least with more questions and answers in the end, but um, I nevertheless want to raise them. Um, first is where do climate urgency claims come from? So this is, I think, something uh, where research needs to put a focus on who articulates them and what social and political consequences do they entail? Second, how do social movements mobilize and politi politicize time or not? And I think this is quite encouraging to see an emerging uh, field of research here. And a third of all, bringing in um, aspects of justice related to time-related issues. Who are the winners and losers of the time-related climate change agenda? And that, um, sorry for taking so much time. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jens, for a stimulating presentation and for raising these further questions that maybe we can come back to um, at the end. Um, but uh, moving on to our next speaker, Annalene Kenis. Um, We'll speak about time and depoliticization. So I think that follows nicely from uh, the things that uh, Jens has been saying will be applied a bit more to what social movements are actually doing. And so the question is, if time moves to the center of the climate agenda, we urgently have to study what it means for time to be depoliticized or politicized. And for the political struggle um, to have time as one of its key stakes, how can climate activism account for temporality in its politics? how to deal with the clashing views of historical time, its meaning and directionality. Marlene, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Jos. You summarized that really well. So um, obviously you can look at this, these questions from different angles. And I've chosen for this presentation to start from a very specific temporal dimension, namely the world of movement, the animate movement, I mean about climate movement, and um, more in particular, I will focus on two grassroots climate movements, namely uh, Extinction Rebellion and the School Strike for Climate, which have been mentioned several times here already. But I, what I wanted to say is I will start from the world the movement attributes to the future. And that's 
as I mentioned already, just an entrance point. Obviously, there are different ways of trying to answer these questions. And as we have seen already in the previous presentations, so I'm maybe repeating a few things here, but the time figures centrally in climate discourses today, and that is both the case in terms of, of the now, which is very present in climate discourses and in present of, and in terms of the future. However, interestingly, it is only the now that is actually full of meaning. The future is remarkably empty, or to be more precise, it's actually only present or especially present in its negativity, in something one wants to ward off. And this is actually not something new, as uh, amongst others, Eric Swingedau already uh, noticed in 2010, in contrast to other struggles, the currently existing climate struggle has no positively embodied name or signifier, no vision, myth, or imaginary ideal waiting to be realized. The temporal dimension of the now, on the other hand, has been strongly politicized. Again, if you take, for instance, the school strikes for climate, um, by claiming that there is no point in obediently attending school when climate change is looming, they do not only interrupt the time of daily affairs, they do not only interrupt the town, the now, but they also make it very clear that the time to act is now, not somewhere at an undefined point in the future. Similarly, Extinction Rebellion or XR strongly politicizes the now, putting act now very clearly into practice. With their request to declare a climate emergency, now again, they furthermore distinguish themselves from those who might pay lip service to the climate crisis, but don't show in their daily acting how serious the climate crisis actually is. At the same time, their struggle seems to be centered around and also to a certain extent limited to something they want to ward off again. Or as a spokesperson of XR aptly summarized a few days ago, the question is not how you want to live, but do you want to live at all? Remarkably, the movement doesn't even really formulate suggestions on how to work of climate change. So that is, so its participant state has to be set, decided by a citizens assembly. And I would argue a movement almost couldn't stay more in the now. It doesn't, it's not only that it doesn't have a clearly articulated future imaginary, but it doesn't even have a clearly articulated strategy beyond acting now. My argument would be that we can understand both movement acts of politicization on the basis of Walter Benjamin's work, more precisely, the distinction he makes between full and empty time. In Benjamin's work, empty time refers to a homogenized conception of time, whereby each moment equals the other. Typical examples are the timeline or the clock. A full conception of time, on the other hand, understands each now moment as a nexus of specific contingent possibilities. And I would argue that a full conception of time politicizes as it recognizes in each now moment the possibility to act. Full time is therefore, so I would say, key to interpolating people as political subjects. Furthermore, it makes us aware of possibilities in the present which might change the future. Empty understandings of time in contrast tend to conceal this. They create the illusion that what is not done today can still be done tomorrow. What is this at stake is that the time to act can be missed and might never return. So if we relate this to both movements, we could argue that both the school strikes for climate and XR embrace a full conception of time, which triggers mobilizing forms of political subjectification and which might also explain both movements' success in terms of passion, energy, and numbers. Furthermore, this might also be one of the features that distinguishes both movements from mainstream climate discourses, which I would argue are often characterized by an empty concept of time. Being stuck in a perception of time as linear and homogeneous, they fail to understand the now time in a political way. By focusing, for instance, on future mitigation scenarios, they make abstraction from the concrete moment when action is required, required or becomes possible as a result of conjunctural events. As a result, I think this might partly explain 
why they are little mobilizing and sometimes strongly depoliticizing. Still, politization of the now doesn't necessarily mean an emptiness of the future. That is something we see, I think, in the school sites of climate and in Extinction Rebellion. But if you look at, uh, for instance, intergenerational struggles of the past, like uh, May 68, there was actually in this movement a combination of a strong politicization of both the now and the future. So while for May 68, the future, I'm sorry, I'm losing, I can't see you anymore. Okay, okay, now it's back again. Whereas for May 68, the future was open. Today, the climate movement, um, for the climate movement, the future, I would say, is haunted by the past. In that sense that greenhouse gases emitted in the past are there to stay till at least a while in the future, the movements sees in the future, especially the past. And here, like, um, I found this, um, the slogan of May 68 quite revealing because there they say the future will only contain what we put into it now. And that's actually almost the opposite of the um, way the climate movement today feels about the future. So while May 68 started from the desire for another future, the new climate movement starts from the need to do so. That's another difference. While May 68 was about changing life as we know it, at least part of the new climate movements want to ward off climate change in order to preserve what they currently value and know. While May 68 was hugely emancipatory, in terms of staging themselves as a generation that would make a difference, the new climate movement asked the government to act or outsource political decisions to a citizens' assembly. So obviously, citizens' assembly can be emancipating as well. So it's not meant to only criticize this approach, but there is something about not, not taking political decisions themselves. But then an important question is, of course, can one fully politicize the present without politicizing the future? Chantal Mouffe argues that repoliticization requires a debate in the democratic political and public sphere about possible alternatives to the existing hegemonic order. And indeed, I would argue that if we talk about the political or politicization, two questions are key. And I think both of them are also very relevant if we talk about, if we think about climate change and time. The first question is how to create political subjectivity, or if we apply this to the question we are thinking about today, how can time discourses interpolate people to become political subjects who act politically here and now, or alternatively, how can they demobilize or disempower people? So, and I think in, on that level, both the Extinction Rebellion and Youth um, Climate Strike, the School Strikes for Climate, did remarkably well. So there is also a second question, which is relevant if we talk about the political or politicization, and that is how to open up a space for democratic debate and envisioning of different future possibilities or applied um, to our topic of time and climate change. How can time discourses undermine or contribute to democratic plurality? How do they influence the range of future options available to us? How do they affect democratic conflict and the way the opponent is treated or looked at? And I think at this level, something interesting seems to be taking place. So while both movements explicitly refrain from embracing a particular future imaginary and even explicitly call themselves apolitical, at least um, the school sites for climate in Belgium have been doing that, or beyond politics, that's what XR says, of, and often even refuse to engage in a discussion on this terrain, they nevertheless seem to have created a space where politicization can happen. As we are speaking about current movements, movements which are in the case of XR in the streets right now, it's of course very difficult to say something definitive about it. But I think that we can argue that at least um, in the case of Extinction Rebellion, a process of politicization, a much clearer positioning 
is taking place. As, um, they're staging themselves much more clearly in a political way, even if they still uphold this uh, idea of being beyond politics. And interestingly enough, this doesn't really go together with the kind of future imaginary that one is still empty, but at least they're pointing more clearly to responsibles for the current crisis. And obviously pointing to responsibles, like for instance, Shell, who is sponsoring the, the Science Museum in London, then you're also saying something about what has to happen instead. So I think it remains to be seen, of course, like how the movements will further evolve and whether they will also dare to take distance from their own statement that they're beyond politics and thereby um, will they dare to really um, take up the political position, which I think they already um, embraced. Will they dare to take it up themselves? And another question related that, to that is, of course, whether if they do that, enough members will stay engaged because, and that's my last slide here, so don't worry. I think it's important to see that politicization also entails a risk. Like I think we often tend to think too much about the politicization as a, the problem and politicization which has to happen. And mainly that is obviously the case, but there is also a problem with uh, politicization if it goes too far, namely it might also um, mean losing the unity of the movement and thereby it might also bring the movement to an end itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annalene, for a very stimulating and interesting presentation. Uh, again, many questions uh, raised, probably already have many more than, than we could answer in a week, but it's, it's lovely to see all these time-related thoughts. Um, it's clearly a, an important topic in the field. Um, I would like to move on to the final presentation uh, by Nicole Deur um, on temporality and strategies. And on the question of whether activists should focus on putting pressure on governments to solve the crisis through the channels of representative democracies or use protest and disruptions potentially even to occupy institutional politics or given the continued failure of governments to act, has it become time for activists to take matters into their own hands by focusing on do-it-yourself activism, self-government and democracy from below instead? Um, those were some of the introductory questions we, we gave to Nicole, but uh, floor is yours. Uh, looking forward to hear what you have to say. Yeah, thank you so much, Joost. And thank you also for having this order because my presentation really annually follows up directly on what on yours and onto what um, you have been, the others have been saying before. Um, here's a picture of XR activists Denmark. It's, uh, but they're all uh, international <laughs> exchange students. So they're not just Danish students who stormed the parliament. And they also inspired by the British um, XR uh, claim to have an alternative people's assembly to talk about climate justice, you know, that the Danish government has actively promised to take measures on climate, po climate policy, but it doesn't actually implement them because it's the government after all. Um, and so that's really also part of what the of the questions that Joost um, has been asking to me. So how can protest and disruption um, go together with taking pressure on governments and institutions? Can they? Is one better than the other? What's the role of democracy in movements, democracy um, from below or self-government? Um, so here you have a disruption that created a lot of media attention. And in my first slide, which is this one, you have um, activists near my village um, uh, next to Frankfurt or between Frankfurt and Kassel in a forest. Germany, the government wants to build a new highway. It's actually the green, green government of that state um, where I'm actually based right now that pushed the construction of a new highway through a protected forest that also um, basically has a water reserve uh, for Frankfurt and for half a million people. So I, as a researcher for the first time was also among the affected population. And I still have difficulties to study that that's one of my case studies because it emotionally affects me so much. And that fits nicely to the pictures um, that you showed and the questions that you've raised um, in, in the presentations before and in the discussions before. We're actually um, already in that, in, that, um, in that times up moment. Um, 
and um, and the movements are living in democracy and movements in the forest or in extinction rebellion alternative democratic models and what research is telling us and research done by um, Stine Kroyer, for example, my colleague in Copenhagen, um, is that um, democracy and movements among the three squatters, for example, it helps people to switch from complete apathy into active time. Um, and it also helps people to reconnect to nature. Uh, John Drizek, um, the deliberative democratic theorist from Australia, um, is talking a lot about how we should listen to nature and include nature's voice into democracy, which of course doesn't happen. But so the activists, the three squatters whom I interviewed near my village, they feel this connection to nature. So this democracy movement has one important effect. It has a feel good effect for the people who are involved in it, both the residents who are affected by a dramatic climate change. They don't sit at home, cry or kill themselves. Um, they feel in community, in connection, um, and that the radical tree sitters, they lose fear if they engage in a lot of collective action with others. But at the same time, my question in this presentation to you will be, um, does it matter beyond movements? Is there a broader effect? And how can we connect the small communities and movements, the kind of oasis that are popping up all over the place, um, to the big democracy in our institutions, which we see we see as failing. So I think we're, we're talking here, we're in a moment of our system, there won't be democracy as we know it, just in a couple of years from now. And it's already the case in some countries. And that's due to climate change among others. But we also have um, a fin an ongoing financial crisis and our systems, our financial systems, our economic systems are breaking down. So I think that something that hasn't been written about or maybe, and I don't know where, um, is that those small movement democracies, the climate activists, the, the XR or whatever, um, they are actually the communities that are gonna survive while our systems are breaking down. And so that would be interesting to study. Um, um, and so, so I'm gonna talk about how these democracies themselves break down because they don't function and people are people and they are, um, some people are leaving because others got too hegemonic in the movement. But I'm also trying to see how disruption, um, the strategy of movements can make an impact in institutions and how it can be combined with lobbying, deliberation and persuasion strategically. Um, so what do we know on institutional democratic channels? I'm a sociologist. So I recommend the book by uh, Caroline Lee and others on democratizing inequalities. It's a book on uh, deliberative and participatory democratic um, failures. Um, that's basically the idea that um, you include people in deliberation about institutional polit politics and policies. And what we see is that it's always being used in a manipulative way. And the book is really interesting about that. At the same time, um, if you think about representative democracy, so changing systems through voting, what do we learn from previous research? Um, one thing that I was wanting to mention is the green parties, like I'm speaking from Germany, I'm discussing with so many people about what to vote for since the green parties are also an example of cooptation and, um, and of um, a grassroots movement that went away that was both successful institutionally, but then it didn't implement what the, the people had hoped for. Um, so this is what some of the dilemmas of rep representation that people have been showing, um, Jennifer Hedden, Louisa Parks, that we also see at the, look, at the EU level when it comes to environmental politics and the greens. Um, but then also in my own book, um, I found, I, I looked at, um, at um, uh, participatory and democratic um, processes that were part of uh, representative systems at the local level and where the movement voted into office some candidates. So you actually really combine the movement strategy with the guy who runs for us. And what I found there sadly was that even the movement candidates at the local level where they had no power or very little power got immediately uh, corrupted 
changed their view, were brainwashed because they worked in a new environment and that and disconnected from their voters, um, which was really sad and contentious. But that was because they worked with an individual or they were trapped in an individual profit maximizing logic. Um, so they they were only interested in staying in the system and not um, going outside. So here are some pictures from my research. Um, so the question is, can you, how can movements challenge institutions from within? I thought a lot about it um, in studying these, these activist groups um, in the Europe and US, global justice, environmentalist and anti-racist activists. And I found that something that I also wanted to mention for this panel is that surprisingly, counterfactually, sometimes you can actually reach the decision the movement wants um, towards changing things at the highest level of decision making, like at the EU level rather than at the national level, and for sure not at the local level. So how is that possible? What I found is that sometimes you have actors who are really close to the ones who take the decisions, but they themselves hold, hold no power. So in our systems, this, this could be media actors. You could even imagine bureaucrats, technocrats like the European Commission. It will never happen, but it could in theory happen that some of these bureaucrat, technocrats, mediators say, um, we stop doing what we've done so far because you're so incredibly undemocratic leaders. You're so, so corrupted. And so this is what I found within um, social movement decision-making at the highest level. Thank you, um, um, where you had unionists, um, party members and activists. Um, so when people refuse to continue, do the job as usual, I call them political translators. So that, uh, that's an inside outside strategy for movements that combines dialogue and disruption. So now let's look at protest and democracy, these emerging communities. Here are two pictures from the US, take back the city and on the right side, that's again, the forest next to Frankfurt. Um, so what I wanna argue is that democracy makes a difference, democracy and movement makes a difference if it's connected to the interest of those affected. And that's a critical point I make myself because I noticed that many of the young activists came from the cities and they had high ideals, but it was more challenging for them to connect to the social class and the uh, experiences of the locals who were um, living next to the forest. But it's possible um, that they did so. And when, um, when these kind of political translation processes in movement um, succeed, um, you have ordinary people switch um, from hopelessness about the failure of democracy and institution from voting to the far right or something like that into an active notion of time. So I did this eight year ethnographic study on democracy and movements and in institutions. And I, have, I found that both in institutions, in mainstream participatory democratic processes at the local level and in movements, you always had hegemonies and exclusions, but sometimes dialogue can, could, write, could create these breakthrough decisions. Um, and that was always when the, you had a group who intervened as critical political translators, a group who had the power and the agency to combine disruption with persuasion. So just, that's my almost last slide. Um, so who are political translators? They're people who claim for themselves a new position for the third in consensus-based democracy. So they don't think they are neutral facilitators, but they're people who listen really carefully to what is unfair and to when one group dominates. And unlike to just disrupt like anarchists um, have always done or like autonomous strategies, they're actually um, using this combination of disrupt and then dialogue and use a mediator position in order to ch challenge the consensus. Um, yeah, and that's a little bit connected to Rancière. Um, I can tell more about that, but what I wanted to, to say in this whole thing is that democracy and time, um, democracy is successful if it creates these new connections between people and nature. And if it does, so it could change. Um, and if that diffuses um, to, to mainstream representative systems, uh, we could actually um, have a better outcome um, in, a, in, a, in a much, um, yeah, 
in a really threatening um, world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you so much all for your uh, presentations and your thoughts. Um, there's already some questions coming in uh, into the chat. Um, to kick us off, um, one of the things that I've been wondering about before this, this, this round table and during the round table is that time is, can be very abstract, can be quite difficult to think with. Jens made some efforts to make it a bit more concrete, what we might mean by time, but it's so natural that it's quite untangible. And actually, when I interview activists uh, and try to talk with them about futures um, and about time, it doesn't seem to be something they like to talk about. It seems to be something they consider to frustrate their activism. And we've heard uh, Max comment that, that one of the strategies for getting people involved in um, climate activism or climate action more general perhaps is to be in the here and now. Um, at the same time, also taking this many uh, entry points approach, but then the question perhaps is into what Right, then you enter into, into the political discussion of what it is that we actually need to achieve within a given time. That links for me a bit to, to what Annalyn was saying about empty time and full time in the here and now, again, being important to have full time in the here and now, but that it doesn't guarantee full time in the future. But also the thinking about full time in the future, about the political content of the future, might close political moments in the here and now. So there seems to be this tension around here and now. Nicole also mentioned about prefiguration, doing it here and now being motivating, but at the same time, also perhaps not necessarily providing a clear pathway out of the situation in which we find ourselves. And finally, Jens's efforts to make this discussion more concrete, but still, uh, I, I think leaving us in a place where it's different, where we feel clearly that time is everywhere, that time is socially constructed, but that it's difficult to get a grasp on. So that's sort of to, 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 to draw some lines between the things that I've been hearing you say and to, to, to wrap that up into one question before moving to the questions of the audience and please keep them coming is, should we talk about time at all? Or should we leave it to be naturally in the here and now as seems to be the case where we end up in the context of climate change? I'm happy to just start with a couple of thoughts. Thank you, Joost. And thank you to each of you for your great uh, presentations and provocations. Your, your, your question reminds me of um, what you said at the outset of this idea of the never ending moment of now or never. I thought that was really uh, a fascinating, good way to put it. That um, I do think, you know, to bluntly answer your question, I do think temporality matters tremendously on several fronts. One is just the physical sciences of it, is that uh, emissions that we uh, participate in that we're a part of today can remain in the atmosphere for decades, up to 200 years, when we're talking about carbon dioxide. And so someone who talked about the Model T Ford back in the early 1900s uh, here in the United States, that the emissions from the Model T Ford are the ones that we're dealing with now. And so temporality is tremendously important. If we turn off the spigot, we're still going to be uh, in, still dealing with the effects of a changing climate. And you alluded to that as well when you were talking about the movement to adaptation uh, as well. While I wouldn't treat mitigation adaptation as mutually exclusive, certainly that's relevant here. Uh, I think you know another way though to look at it is that that never-ending moment of now or never can be interpreted through deadlines. And those deadlines, I think, are tremendously problematic. Um, and those are the ones, so since I think I also um, study in part uh, right-wing social movements and some of the contrarian perspectives, those are the ones that are very vulnerable to uh, critique that, okay, yeah, you gave us a 10-year window 10 years ago, and here we are. We're all still alive. We're still fighting through things. And so being very careful about the way in which we're communicating the important moment that we're in here and now, but also talking about how engagement going forward is critically important. There's um, a few thoughts that come to mind for me just to begin. 
Thank you. Uh, Jens? Yeah, maybe, maybe just adding to that, what we could do is to, to reframe the question maybe slightly uh, from should we talk about time to how should we talk about time? So if, we, if we're talking about this deadlineism and um, these following uh, seemingly neutral scientific trajectories about when to, to stop uh, emitting carbon emissions, I think this is um, doing quite a good job in depoliticizing uh, what, what we're seeing here. And, and this, I think, merges with, with the idea of a, of a globalized um, 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 carbon dioxide and, and that, that overshadows inequalities, that overshadows uh, politics behind who's benefiting and who's losing here, that overshadows aspects such as um, on a global scale, the difference between luxury emissions and survival emissions, as Susunika and Orion uh, often points out. So I think for me, the, the important thing is to unpack uh, what, what stands behind these deadlines and what stands behind certain, certain ideas of temporalities and, and, and timescales and, and how different actors, very, very simply put, actually benefit from it or lose from it and what kind of social groups benefit and lose from it. So putting politics um, first when talking about time. Just one suggestion. Thank you, Jens. Uh, Annalena or Nicole, do you, would you want to chip in on this or? Um, sure. Yeah, maybe shortly. I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question directly, but yeah, maybe a few points of first is that I, I, um, I think you're right that it's a very abstract notion and um, it's, um, I think it's a challenge for us as social scientists to connect more abstract political social theory with like the daily experience of people but that, that's one thing but on the other hand i think it's it's really um very important in that sense that um i i would consider myself as a scholar activist so someone who doesn't only write about the movements but also wants to think about how to how to build the movements and personally i i am very reluctant to build the movement with together with people from who i don't know how they think about the future. Like if you stay in the now, in the act now, so we might agree on cutting greenhouse gas emissions, but we might strongly disagree on how to do that. And for me, it personally, it might be even more the discussion on, on what to do or how to cut this greenhouse gas emissions is even more important than whether we will actually succeed doing that. And where the future becomes very, um, very important, like, how, which kind of futures are we building by the actions we, which we are trying to achieve right now? And I think as long as this um, dimension of the future stays empty, it, there is also kind of dangerous evolution which might take place. Like um, there is a, a risk of... Um, what I would say authoritarian solutions or large scale um, geoengineering projects, all kinds of answers to climate change, which would help cutting emissions maybe to a certain extent, or which might reduce global heating to a certain extent, but which have hugely problematic consequences on a whole range of other social, political, uh, physical terrains. And in that sense, like connecting uh, the future to the now is quite crucial, I think. Very briefly, thank you, Annalyn. Um, I also wanted to say, just first of all, the question you asked is incredibly important, um, and maybe this is yeah, yeah. And um, and and just one point, um, I have the highest respect of people who are trying to enter into government to change things right now, but like Annalyn said, the the horizon of what they think they can imagine is so constrained. And sometimes we, meet, we need people, movements, mediator, trans, mediators, translators, many, many people who use protest and disruption in a smart way to widen the perspective of what can be seen and heard. Just think about the pictures you showed, like the pictures by Annalyn about the, the New York City and the waves. Why don't we listen to that? Do we have to be affected ourselves in order to make a change? How can we widen the horizon? in the here and the now. I think that's a crucial question right now. Thank you all. Okay, thank you very much for these, these answers. Um, I suggest we move to the questions. 
uh, that are in the uh, in the chat right now. Um, I think let me see. There was already quite early on a question from uh, Lena Pachtch uh, for uh, for Maxwell uh, and others. Um, so I think anyone can chip in, and, and I'll take a few questions at the same time just to make sure we get through some of them and might see some links between them. So given time constraints, is it legitimate to target shareholders like JP Morgan to do divestments, although these capitalist companies are at the very root of most environmental problems, instead of turning to democratically elected representatives? Um, so that was first question by Lena. There was a question of clarification uh, as well about the role of the green government, but I think that that was already uh, addressed. But Nicole, if you want to add anything on that, then feel free to do so, of course. Um, and the, um, I think there was another, I cannot see, I think it was Peter Fine who asked two questions. And I think I will ask Nicole to respond to the second question because it's a bit closer to the general debate here. Can you elaborate uh, on how someone can act as disruptor and mediator at the same time? Sounds like a role that is uh, conflicting to me. Um, and then perhaps we take one more question. Sarah's question, uh, to what extent do the narratives, discourses around time, urgency, tipping points, et cetera, act as a mobilizer or a break to environmental activism and among what type of activists, especially young people? So here's a set of questions. Um, and yeah, please feel free to, uh, respond and in your if you're in your answers you want to respond to what any one of the other presenters has been saying and of course that's also welcome perhaps i can just start to respond to lena's question um i think uh one of the one of the points that i tried to make was that um many different efforts are needed so this idea that i called silver buckshot, which has been borrowed from many others talking about this before in other domains. But so to the, the question that she posed, I think both are critically important. Um, and that's not to evaluate one in, in light of the other, but rather to say that how people engage in ways in which they're capable of engaging um, is important and being encouraged. And so for uh, those who want to engage in shareholder spaces, I think that can be important. And those who want to engage in uh, democratic election, uh, elections, that's also important. And just based on this, Annalene had very importantly pointed out that certain actions can prove to be problematic or, or damaging. Um, there's many ways to, to to think about that. Um, Saffron O'Neill, who's a scholar at Exeter University and others have talked about um, maladaptation is reactions that may not in the medium to long term be um, constructive. I'll also just point out though that inaction is really a form of action. And so inaction can be status quo activity and that is a form of action. So we ought to unpack and denaturalize the inaction or status quo um, behaviors that are taking place in everyday society, in um, our elected leaders, in our behaviors of carbon-based industry as well, and, and critique that and analyze how that, what can be seen as inaction is, is actually action that can impede the kind of decarbonization that we need um, going forward. Any of the speakers like to, well, there was a direct question for Nicole, even though I've seen already that you've also been uh, active in the chat already, but maybe uh, if, you, if you think it's useful, you can maybe give a more yes. general answer to the, to the audience. And if someone would also like to pick up on Sarah's question, it would be great as well. And there, there's also one for Annalyn now, I see. So on uh, Peter's question, um, can you be a, how can you be a disruptor and a mediator at the same time? Well. That's exactly what translators have to do all the time. If you think about linguistic interpreters, they have to both make the float of the conversation go, facilitate understanding, 
So that's mediation. That's always, you're always in the dialogue. But if one party doesn't listen to the other, you notice because you're the mediator. So you can disrupt or interrupt or say, wait a second. And this wait a second thing, that's already enough. And what I found is that interestingly, translators, interpreters use that in a progressive way to actually stop dominant people. Psychologists do the same. And Jessica Benjamin has written about it. Jacques Rancière talks about that um, as interpretation politique, political interpretation. Um, and so we can think about a third actor who has the power to both facilitate dialogue and to interrupt it. And we can think about in which policy areas and pol political forums we have such actors. And they need to work together in order to create a movement of political translators. Thank you for the question. Um, some additional questions, Jens, do you want to respond? Yeah. Maybe just, just very quickly to, to Sarah's question. Um, <laughs> but once again, not, not a good answer here, but, but again, something I think um, I, I, I mean, I think that the point is a very fascinating dilemma or a kind of mental issue here that these urgency narratives are a mobilizer and, and obviously on the streets you see these, these time related claims that, that, that uh, mobilize protests but at the same time um, it, it, it seems fascinating because it is so frustrating and discouraging um, to see that no matter what you do in, in your local initiatives, in your global initiatives, it probably won't, won't be enough to uh, to solve the global uh, to, to, to solve the climate crisis, and I think you, you and I we had some a lot of discussions about this um, from, from his research um, and movements. And um, I mean, based on my very anecdotal uh, insights from Fridays for Future activists, this is uh, this this is a fascinating puzzle in a way that it drives them on the streets, although knowing that what they're doing is um, won't won't or that that the, the to system change needed um, to to um, uh, to to tackle the climate crisis will won't be uh, achieved through this protest. So I think um, basically bringing it back as as an as a as a question again um, that's that's yeah kind of an interesting phenomenon to see and to um, to study. I would say. Yeah, maybe since Jens mentioned uh, the research that we're doing together, I'm just sort of chip in on that with one or two second uh, sentences. But I think time and, and urgency tipping points is important for activists to become mobilized, to give them a sense of urgency, to get them active. But what I see is also that then once someone is active, that then that discussion of time is closed. Like then as soon as you're active, and in a lot of cases in climate activism, the activism being quite therapeutic, where, where being active is felt as being uh, empowering and addressing climate anxiety. From that moment onwards, I think the discussion about time becomes quite unwelcome uh, because it reintroduces that sense of anxiety, which had just been overcome by the activism. But that arguably problematically forecloses the discussion of uh, that allows us to turn, as in Anna Lin's words, the future time from, from empty time into full time and to have a more political debate about that. So that's maybe just a my two cents on that. Um, I think maybe Anna Lynn, you might have something to say about that question as well. But in at the mean in the meantime, I'll then also read out uh, Michael's question. Uh, maybe you can see whether you address them both or uh, one of them. So Michael asks: Isn't one of the success factors of Fridays for Future and XR that they keep open what they mean by future? Politicizing is, uh, it might not only disrupt movement unity, but also disrupt the diverse audiences that sympathize with their now claims. Um, and in the meantime, there was a question by Boris basically to ask for some suggestions for literature. I suggest that if any of the speakers or panelists or attendees has suggestions for Boris, that they write them in the chat, that we don't sort of take that um, in the limited time that we have available now. So please, if you can write to Boris with suggestions, that, that would be most welcome. But uh, Annalyn, to you. Uh, yeah, sure. And yours, what was the other question again? You said there are two questions. One is... Uh, so you, have, you had Michael's question, uh, and there was Sarah's question uh, that Jens already picked up on, but, but that you might have something to say about as well. To what extent do the narratives or discourses around time, urgency, tipping points, etc., act as mobilizer or a break to environmental activism? 
and among what type of activists, especially young people? Okay. Um, yeah, these are all very relevant questions, of course. So I think, um, Michael, or Michael, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, you're absolutely, um, you're absolutely right in that. Um, so it um, might disrupt the diverse audiences that sympathize with their now claim. On the other hand, um, keeping not only the future, that's also your demands to a certain extent empty, also empty as a risk. And for instance, if you look to the school strikes for climate in Belgium, you see that very soon they were recuperated with forms of neutralization and recuperation, exactly because actually everyone would agree with what I was saying. They had a broad audience of people who all sympathize with the idea that we had to do something or that we have to do something about climate change now. It's actually quite difficult to be against that. Of course, there's still people against us these days, but in general, we all agree. But I think it's an illusion to assume that agreement is what we need to take action. And I think that's where the climate movement, the broad climate movement, and I mean both like the mainstream climate movement, the NGOs, and a, a, a number of grassroots climate movements have been wrong historically, thinking that the more people would agree, the more, the more we would be able to um, realize consensus with regard to climate change, the more likely it would be that action would be taken. And we actually like, in that sense, I'm of course very much influenced by post-foundational political theory and by a number of the authors I've mentioned already, like Chantal Mouf and um, Eric Swingedal, but also Jacques Concier and a number of other authors who actually say, what is essential is disagreement or conflict. That's what creates passion. That's what mobilizes people. And that's also how things change. And um, it's actually quite interesting. It's maybe a bit of a strange reference to make, but Max, you were referred to this, um, to this, uh, you showed this graph of how um, media works. Uh, like um, this is a circle of like, um, how, how um, events are taken up and then presented in the media. And it's like um, in, in the work of, um, in the work you presented, it's, it's presented as a, as a circle, but actually I've, I've shown in some previous research, actually should in a sense it as a spiral in that sense that like um, by creating conflict, you get something on the political agenda because it's more and more taken up and you create a kind of dynamic which wasn't there before. Okay, I realize that it's maybe a bit abstract and taking us too far. But I think maybe what's what's the essence of what, what, what I want to say is that, yes, um, if demands are be, most, be, made more, be made more specific, um, some people might um, not be put off by the movement. But on the other hand, I think that's the only way to get things moving because as long as we all agree we all agree that something has to happen and on the other at the same time nothing happens at all it's maybe a bit of a bold statement but let's see what you think about it thank you um there is uh two questions that i overlooked because they were not in the chat but in the q a it's a bit confusing to have these two channels what i propose considering that we are actually now at the end of the session or at least at the allocated time I hope we won't be kicked out sharply in two seconds. But so what I would like to do is I'll, I'll read out those questions that are remaining um, in the Q&A. And from that, I'd like to give every each one of you to give a, a final response. You can see if you can answer the questions that are remaining in that or whether you want to turn somewhere else. Um, and then we'll round up. Um, so uh, Andrea asks, I am wondering how you see the role of a potential generational conflict in relation to the time dimension of climate change. Do you think generations are still relevant in structuring preferences on the issue? Or do you rather feel that as the effects of climate change are becoming more and more tangible in the here and now, generational divisions lose their importance? Is perhaps the role of generational conflict uh, overstated? And it's a very good question, uh, considering that we are now seeing the first generations being born into quite certainty that they will live in a world that looks very different from the one we already know now. Uh, it's a very timely question. Um, Nagme already uh, um, asked the question and Nicole has already given an answer, but I'd just still like to uh, read out Nagme's question. 
Um, are citizen assemblies the answer to talking about visions of the future, or are there other fora that could serve that purpose? So if you want to address any of those questions in your final statements, and maybe we can just take the order in which we started talking, so starting with Max. Thank you, and thank you again for everyone who's come, and thank you for your presentations. Thanks, Joost, for organizing along with Jens. Um, in terms of, I think, generational considerations are very important. Uh, I don't think that they lose their value when we're talking about here and now, or when we're um, having these conversations as we frame them. In fact, I think it's opening up those conversations. I'll just point you to one series that I found really interesting that's just uh, come into my awareness lately, which is an elders, the elders intergenerational climate series, which features young climate activists all around the world talking about their livable future planet in conversation with generations past. Um, I, I, I'm happy to put a link into the chat if it's helpful. And it's just a way to show that by talking about the here and now and talking about urgency, it can put into conversation these generational perspectives and to also honor and, and welcome in experiential ways of knowing through um, our elders with the concerns of young people. And so um, I think that's a great set of questions that have been posed um, by Andre, but I, I also just think that rather than closing down generational divisions and losing their importance, I think it opens them up. So I'll leave it there as I know we're over time and there's others to speak, but thank you very much again. Thank you, um, Jens. Um, I had actually very substantial things to, to say here. Uh, and just thanks, Maxwell, for, for putting this up here. I think this is also what I initially thought that um, these general, well, it's more about overcoming these general conflicts and, and, and talking to each other in a way to how to envision the future. Because the, I mean, the, the grown and the young of today will be the old of tomorrow. So they will all constant um, renegotiation between uh, different generations. So, uh, so to speak. And on the on the question of, of city assembly uh, assemblies, I think um, also echoing what Nicole wrote already. For me, this is this is a great opportunity to put alternatives on the table and I think this is also what we need to um, reflect about what are alternatives in terms of what kind of future society to live in in terms of how we organize societies in the future and and, and this is where when new voices need to come in so when um, um, not um, fixed but but whether um, um, a randomly selected people come together I think this is a good way to open up the the predefined and narrow idea of uh, how our society should work. Thank you, Jens. Um, Annalyn, any answers to these final questions or general final words? I think the one uh, about citizens' assemblies is a is a very good question. I think actually we should we should have a panel debate or a roundtable on that one specifically at another time because it's um, I see that it's more and more put forward by movements as a kind of um, way out of the crisis and I also understand why I understand all the critiques on the current political system but personally um, and also again because I'm very much inspired by post-foundation political theory and what I call the democracy um, I'm also a bit skeptical about the idea because for all kinds of reasons but to say it in a very simplistic way like we have been long, or social movements have very long struggled for one person, one vote. And with citizens' assemblies, at least to the extent, again, depending on how you conceive them, if you would have plenty of them on a local scale, that would be something completely different. But the way that, for instance, Extinction Rebellion imagines them, it's like one national citizens' assembly of 500 people randomly selected who have to make, who has to make decisions, which has to make decisions which will be put in place, then I think it's, it's very activating for all the people who are involved, but all the other people are rendered invisible and are not interpolated to become political subjects. And I would think we need, if we want to have more democracy, we should think about ways 
of interpolating as many people as possible to see themselves as politic sub political subjects and not uh, just a very um, limited group of randomly selected people. So I could say much more about that, but that would take us too far. But I think I understand where the idea comes from, and I think it has something emancipating, but it also might not be um, uh, as liberating as people expect it to be. Thank you, Annalyn. And the final word to Nicole. Thank you, Annalyn. You spoke from my heart, and I wanted to add one point. Um, which is that think about the French Revolution and assembly decided that from tomorrow on everyone is going to be a citizen. I mean, all the male, oh. <laughs> so that didn't, but at least. So that was what uh, was his name, Randall Collins, called like a moment when a lot of people were engaged in debate and it could make a breakthrough. Um, what, I, what we find in Aarhus and in, in, in Danish city councils that have these assemblies everyone wants climate change, the political parties are blocked, but the assembly really widens what they think they can imagine. That's what Jens already said. But like Annalyn said, what they think is still all very limited. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, great note to end on uh, that. I guess the future can open up in the here and now, uh, but it doesn't necessarily so do so. There's political work that's needed um, for that. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank again, uh, all the panelists, all the participants, uh, the ones who've just been listening in, as well as the ones who've been asking questions. Thank you for staying with us to the very end uh, of this conference. And, and as regards to this panel, uh, the question that we started with um, namely, whether we have run out of time is for this panel, definitely yes at the moment. And otherwise, I think it's an open question uh, that we need to keep um, revisiting. And I think we'll see a lot of research uh, coming forward uh, in that field. I've seen some special issue calls from various journals uh, that go in that direction. So it's a fascinating field of research. And uh, thanks to everyone for contributing uh, to this discussion today. Um, I hope you've had a nice conference and um, yeah, with that, um, hope to see many of you in person soon. <laughs>